Как правильно ударить барабан? And then you listen back, and you're like, what the hell was that? Дошло до убийства между барабанщиками. Туриста, туриста. So then I went to lunch, had some borscht. Всем привет! Меня зовут Борис Лившец. Я уже 12 лет являюсь барабанщиком группы B2. Сегодня речь пойдет не обо мне, а о том, что оказало на меня очень большое влияние и изменило мой взгляд на профессию, на мою игру. Есть те, кого знают, а есть такие звезды, которые известны только во внутренних кругах специалистов, музыкантов. Таким человеком является Дэниел Глаз, исследователь, историк, виртуозный барабанщик и, самое главное, учитель, преподаватель от Бога. Человек, знающий о барабанах, чуть больше, чем все. Hello. Hello. Спасибо. Thank you for having me on your program. It's wonderful. Had very had good time in Russia. Ты был в Санкт-Петербурге, играл мастер-класс. Вот. Сейчас ты в Москве. Какие у тебя ощущения? Россия фантастическая страна. Uh, I was here in 1987, in the old days, the communist days. I was here in 2005 with my band, uh, Royal Crown Review, and now I'm here again. And every time I come, things are just changing an incredible rate. Я слышал, что в первый приезд у тебя были какие-то приключения. Yes, should I explain them? Если не сложно, в двух словах. I stayed in the Hotel Rossia, very huge hotel. I was with a group of Americans and many young Russians. We were communicating with them, hanging out and trading clothes and other things. We had a special pass to get into the hotel. The rest of the group I was with looked so obviously American that they just said, you don't have to show your pass, go ahead. But I had long hair at the time and I looked not very American. I guess. So one time I just walked into the hotel, said, hello, didn't show my pass. And I got out of the elevator and two men came up on either side of me and took me downstairs into a secret police station in the basement of the hotel. <laughs> they only spoke Russian to me and they put a piece of paper in front of me. They wanted me to sign all in Russian. And I said, ah, turista. <laughs> so my passport was in my room. So we had to walk all the way to my room. Mm -hmm. And the Hotel Rossia is big. So I'm walking down the hall, maybe for 10 minutes with these two guys, you know, plain clothes guys. So then I went to lunch, I had some borscht. Perfect. No problem. Я хочу сказать, что уже полтора года я uh, занимаюсь у Дэниела. Хочу, чтобы он рассказал о тех моментах, которые очень сильно изменили меня как музыканта. In addition to studying the drums and studying technique, I've spent the last 20-something years studying the history of drumming. There are many, many valuable lessons to be learned from what the older drummers did, even though the music they played maybe looks different and sounds different from today's music. There's a good analogy, I think, to Star Wars, where uh, the first Star Wars movie, Luke Skywalker, second He goes to Yoda's planet, and what he learns on Yoda's planet is some very ancient secrets that are very powerful that people today don't remember because so much time has passed. And when he's able to integrate those secrets or those ancient technologies, it changes everything. I think um, older drummers, when they played before without microphones without uh, amplification, they were tapped into some secrets or some techniques, very simple. And if we can understand more about what they were doing, it helps us today um, with more modern styles and more modern environment in studios and with microphones and things.
Дэниел рассказывает э, очень много, ну, в общем-то, весь его мастер-класс был посвящен шафлу. И мне интересно, почему вот он именно шафл настолько выделил из всех музыкальных стилей и жанров и такое количество времени уделил ему. Почему он считает его настолько важным? People think maybe there's only one way to play a shuffle or shuffles only happen in the blue, in blues drumming, for example. But if you start to look at the history of shuffles, you realize they're everywhere. They're in jazz, blues, rock, funk, hip-hop, soul, country music, reggae music, and ska music, gospel chops. All of these styles originally evolved out of shuffles. So mm -hmm. if you understand more about shuffles, you can play every one of these styles much better. So in my clinic, I demonstrate maybe 10 or 12 different kinds of shuffles going from the 1930s to up to today and show how they're all connected. What's challenging about a shuffle is that the eighth notes are not evenly spaced, right? They're spaced unevenly. So for example, even eighth notes, one and two and three and four and shuffled eighth notes, one and two and three and four and one, right? So if a drummer can successfully learn how to control shuffled eighth notes, when they go back to the even eighth notes, they're going to have much more awareness and understanding and control of the even eighth notes. Я у Дэниела учусь там примерно полтора года, и мы так и не добрались до шафла. You're an incredible student. Woo! Learn so fast. Really good. шафлы, я бы <coughs> хотел поделиться тем, что я успел пройти. На что мне открыл Дэниел глаза, это для начала просто постановка рук. Я бы хотел, чтобы Дэниел продемонстрировал э, и рассказал немножечко о самых простых вещах, о немецком замке, о французском, об американском. There are three principal grips. French, which means the thumb is on top of the stick. German, which means the hand is on top of the stick and traditional, which is, comes from marching, of course, European marching tradition, uh, which was developed because of the slant of the drum, and in the, <clears throat> in the traditional grip, the hand is underneath the stick. So these are the three primary grips that we can trace back hundreds of years. Когда я шел к Дэниелу на первый урок, я прекрасно знал, как я думал об этих постановках, все. Ну, какие там могут быть секреты? Там, так держишь палочку, так или так. Дэниел об этом знает такие нюансы, где держать палец, куда там, на какой фаланге, какой палец важный, куда что оттопырить, там, указательный палец, например, куда должен смотреть. Я бы хотел, чтобы он рассказал об этом. Each of the three grips has three components. The grip component, the fulcrum component, and the hinge component say the German grip, because it's very popular. Uh, the grip component is always where actually are we holding on to the stick. So in the case of the German grip, it's between the, the thumb and the index finger. Essentially, if you press, make a loose fist and just push your thumb into your index finger, that's the grip. The 
fulcrum component is like a balance balance point. So in the German grip, the fulcrum component is the middle finger, and the stick sits on the middle finger. We don't have to squeeze the stick very hard. We can grip the stick, squeeze it fairly lightly, because it's always going to bounce off of the fulcrum. So no problem. I don't have to squeeze the hell out of the stick. And the third component, hinge. Hinge, okay. So what I mean by hinge, of course, is a door swings on a hinge. If we're using the German grip again, the hinge is in the wrist. So it's not the center, but just a little more over is where we want to lift and open up the stick. And when we come down, we want our hand to be flat as it would be if, if it was at our side, just natural. Mm -hmm. In the French grip, we start with an open hand like this, not closed. The grip component is again the thumb pushing the stick into the four fingers, like so. The fulcrum is over the index finger, so, and the hinge is like we're turning a doorknob. If you imagine a doorknob and we're turning the doorknob. So it's literally a turning motion. So looks like this. Turning. Как ты относишься к тому, что многие барабанщики играют в во французском захвате без пальцев? Они вот так закрывают руку, и я в том числе так периодически делаю, когда играю рок, и мне нужен более мощный звук. И играю кистью. Вот так вот. Это правильно или это прям большая ошибка, надо играть только вот так вот? Мне неудобно играть громко с пальцами. Is not to say this is how I want you to use the French grip. It's only to clarify the three components. When we close the hand, the thumb changes position, the fingers close, but the, the three components are the same. If you start with a closed hand, it's harder to understand those three components. It's Their just... fingers. No, it's no, 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 no. Their fingers are open. They don't know where they're holding the stick. Sometimes it's here, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's here. Then the motion, they use the arm, they use the wrist. There's no clarity. So by starting open, we learn the clarity. Then we can close and play like this. A lot of drummers have many questions. So arm wrist or fingers, mm -hmm. which one should I use? When I talk about the hinge, the hinge is in the wrist, but it doesn't mean that sometimes I use the arm along with it, or sometimes I use the fingers. All of them are valid. It just depends on the tempo of the music. So if the tempo is very slow, I'm going to use a bigger mechanism, the arm, along with the hinge. If I'm going so very slow, if I go faster, now I'm using the hinge. But if I go very fast, now I'm going to use my fingers. Mm -hmm. Because the size of the mechanism depends on the speed. If there's very little space, we use a smaller mechanism. Расстояние поднятия палочки всегда одинаковое должно быть. Насколько высоко ее надо поднимать? So if its tempo is here, stick always comes to the same height. If it's slower, a little more, we add a little more arm. So the, we always can get the stick to move continuously without stopping. Faster. It sounds like ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Mm -hmm. You see how easy it is. I could take a nap and just continue to go. French grip, German grip, traditional. Whenever we strike the drum, whether it's in German grip or it's in the French grip or it's in traditional grip, that at the moment of contact, our hand should be simply as it would be at our side, very relaxed and very easy. People think, oh, it's so complicated, and the fingers and the hands and this and that, and I... just take the stick out and knock on a door. You don't knock like this. We don't push our hand into the door. We simply knock and come off. 
very easy and relaxed. If we think about the hinge, we're just knocking on a door. Very simple, natural motion, even though there's a lot to think about mm -hmm. in this grip. Some teachers teach this way. The stick should be the center of the hand, the wrist should be turned. But if I'm standing like this, that's not natural, right? Mm -hmm. You understand? Why would I stand with my hand bent this way when it just wants to be this way? Similarly, many drummers hold the stick like here with the index finger wrapped around the stick like this. So again, if I was to stand like this all day, that would begin to hurt, right? It's not natural for us to put our finger in this position. I should say when I teach, and you know this, I start with very slow, very simple movements that don't even resemble drumming at all. And many of my students, they go crazy. This is not drumming. What do you, what do you want from me here? You know, because they want to go fast, right? But what we have to do is we have to simplify and we have to slow down so we can really understand these three elements of the grip very, very clearly. Clarity plus consistency equals articulation. So what do I mean by that? Clarity means understanding the grip, how you hold the stick, how you move, how you strike the surface. Consistency means being able to do those things over and over and over exactly the same way every single time. If you have clarity and you practice with great consistency, then what you end up with is articulation, which means when you say something, the person on the other side understands exactly what you're saying. Say we're in a beautiful studio and you record something and you're like, yeah, that was beautiful. And then you listen back and you're like, what the hell was that? That didn't sound anything like what I wanted it to sound like. When we listen to a drummer, for example, Steve Gadd, right? Steve Gadd is like Shakespeare, a Shakespearean orator. In other words, he says something, and we hear exactly what he wanted to tell us, and we understand it exactly. Most drummers, are they're talking about... They think they're saying something, but <laughs> articulation is, is very important and mm -hmm. it's very difficult to achieve. It's a big, big deal. It's the difference between an old Lada and a modern Ferrari, right? They both have exactly the same parts and they both do the same thing. They both drive down the road, but the Lada can only go 120 kilometers an hour or something, very slow. The Ferrari can do it so much better. So why does the Ferrari do it better than the Lada? What's the difference? And this is a huge difference, you know, between drummers as well.
many students come to me because they say, I'm a good drummer. I've been playing for many years, but I'm stuck. I can't get any faster or I'm having pain when I play. You had some pain when yeah. we first started. Uh, I'm uncomfortable moving around the drums. Why? I practice and practice and practice. So the answer is in what we're talking about now. Breaking mm -hmm. down, slowing it down, mm -hmm. understanding the, the physical principles. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like science. This is how I got when I studied with Freddie Gruber, I became much better. And so many of, of Freddie's other students, you think about Dave Weckl, his style changed after playing with Freddie, working with Freddie. Steve Smith looked like two different drummers before Freddie and after Freddie. He was already great before, but he's now wizard, you know? These can help any drummer to completely change the, their outlook on how they approach drumming, right? You had that experience yourself. Могли бы мы просто понять принцип самого удара, самого простейшего, просто как правильно ударить в барабан. Потому что, насколько я знаю, твои принципы, барабан бить не надо, надо бить вверх. Most drummers, they only think about the, the down. They only think about the moment when the stick hits the surface and all the intention is focused on the down and no attention is focused on the up. One of the things that I have worked really hard to explain or to teach is that if we think about how we bring the stick up, then the down will be easy and it will be effortless and it will be perfect in terms of time. And if we allow things to fall, right? As opposed to throw them down, it will be relaxed and will create a beautiful pocket. What does it mean, pocket? You know, how do I get the pocket, right? And what we think of is when your hand is in your pocket, it's deep in the pocket, meaning it's really relaxed. If we can utilize gravity and the weight of our arms and legs, we will have the most beautiful pocket you know, sometimes they say his pocket is so wide, you can drive a truck through it. It's all about the up. This is a phrase I use all the time. If I throw the stick, can I also get it to come up to create the next throw? Is there also a way to lift the stick and simply let it drop to get a sound that way without any downward force at all, simply lift and drop. So these two things, one, you throw the stick down and let it rebound, and the other, you lift the stick and let it fall, are called strokes and taps. If you imagine um, molecules are made out of atoms, strokes and taps are like the atoms that we can build all of our drumming molecules out of. So all the rudiments can be broken down into strokes and taps. Out of this, I have developed this exercise that I call throw up. I want to demonstrate now the throw up exercise uh, in the French and the German. And the idea is it's simply this. I want to think about two aspects. I have to throw the stick, but as soon as I throw the stick, I have to allow the stick to come up. So if you think of a wheel, right? Each stroke has a beginning and a middle and an end. And by the time we get all the way around the circle, we're ready to go down again. So, like so. Mm -hmm. If you look at the tip of my stick, it never stops moving. I'm getting two moves, a throw and an up for, for one motion. When you do it for a while, it begins to feel effortless, begins to feel relaxed. It begins to have forward momentum and also to be laid back always should practice it with music because the idea is to feel the pulse. Now we have to talk history again. This is, relates to a historical idea of what I call pulse. If you think of almost every kind of music that drum set players play today, jazz, rock, funk, soul, hip hop, 
All of these styles originated in the United States of America. And part of the reason why they became popular around the world is because they have a certain pulse that feels very good. It feels good to play it, and for an audience, it feels good to listen to it and to move to it. If I hear a song and I just tap my foot, generally that's the pulse, right? Instead of dup chicka dup chicka dup, it's dup chick dup chick dup chick It swings. Right? This is jazz, but it's also same thing. Rock comes out of jazz. Hip hop shuffles again. The thing about all those styles of American music that I mentioned is they have forward momentum, but they're also laid back. This is the magic of mm -hmm. what I call the American pulse. If we can understand as drummers, and if we can capture the essence of the American pulse, then it doesn't matter if we play jazz or rock or funk or hip hop, we can utilize it in what we do because it's there everywhere. Можно ли вкратце перейти к Моллеру? То, что я знал о Моллере до знакомства с тобой, это просто два разных Моллера. В общем, те принципы, которые ты даешь ты, они, опять же, совсем другие, и они мне очень помогли в игре. Let's talk about Moller first. And Sanford Moller. Sanford Moller was an American drummer, military-style drummer, although I think he also played some drum set, who developed a very efficient way of playing so that you could get, say, three strokes for playing just one, three for the price of one, right? This is very helpful if we want to play quickly. Uh, say we take three molar, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, and now both hands play molar, right? And we can play, right? So it allows us to play quickly and efficiently without being tense. So molar is about an arm. It's based in the arm, right? We talked about throw up exercise based in the wrist, even though sometimes the arm moves with it if it's a slow tempo, right? So we can also manipulate the stick with the fingers, right? This is called push-pull technique, mm -hmm. okay? So three mechanisms, arm, wrist, fingers. So for example, jazz, if you have the three molar, right? Using my arm to get three strokes for one, we could turn that into the jazz ride pattern. Same mm -hmm. idea, right? If I'm playing rock, I'm playing hi-hat, and I begin to use fingers and maybe add some molar, you can play faster 16th notes. Or say you're playing Latin music. Samba or something. Now you can begin to apply these principles to what you do. Say you're playing rock and roll and you want to play some fills, a little faster. One, two, three, four. Very easily, very efficiently. Two, one, two, three.
ты э, медленно и объяснить всю структуру удара Моллера, с чего он начинается, куда он идет, потому что с этим огромная путаница, и в интернете масса информации об этом, которая противоречит друг другу. И да, чтобы, чтобы не дошло до убийства между барабанщиками, которые выясняют, какой Моллер правильный, надо услышать, что скажешь об этом ты. There's what they call the Moller whip, right? You know, whip. So I like to, to tell my students, um, Saturday Night Fever, John Travolta, disco dancing, like this, right? Uh -huh. Like a whip, okay? So, or a whip, like this. You're starting the motion from the back and it's coming to the front like a whip. Now, there are many ways to get there. So some drummers, more the traditional way, Jim Chapin and uh, Joe Morello, they say, you know, come out like this. So, but the idea is whether you learn this way or you learn this way and your motion is that. Once you start playing the molar, there's only one way it can move because it's physics, right? They're physical principles In order to achieve this, they all end up in the same place. So whichever pathway you take, the end result is the same. Можно ли вкратце объяснить принцип игры двойного удара? Remember how I said all rudiments are based on strokes and taps. So now doubles, we simply on the way up, we play two taps instead of one. On the way down, we play We double the stroke. Double stroke roll. There are many ways to play a double stroke roll. That's one of them. That's based on strokes and taps and then doubling. Same motion, same exact motion. Combining strokes and taps. Same with paradiddles. Down, up, tap, tap, down, up, tap, tap. If you start with strokes and taps and just learn them by themselves, you can begin to combine them. And this is if we go slow and we think about grip, fulcrum, hinge in all the grips, if we think about balance, consistency, then this is how we build the Ferrari. This is how on the other end it comes out With articulation, clarity. Даниил, спасибо огромное. Мы успели не все, но я надеюсь, мы еще продолжим. Я бы очень хотел, чтобы ты сыграл что-нибудь. Yes, let's play. Yeah. <laughs> And lift shirts. Boris, lift shirts. Right here, baby. This man, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Спасибо. Спасибо. Спасибо.